tonight, we are continuing with our 21 days of prayer. If you've been following us on the internet uh, or been here live in the morning at 6 a.m., Mondays through Fridays, we've been having a prayer time. We've been uh, talking about prayer. We've been praying together. And uh, if you want to see something kind of comical and unscripted uh, uh, this past week, I think it was on uh, Thursday morning or Friday morning, I was driving over here in an automobile that I was borrowing because my car was in a shop and it ran out of gas because the gas gauge... Well, I messed up. And, and you get to see us have a prayer meeting at the side of the road. And my rescuer comes to save me. I'm not going to say who it is. You need to watch it. A lot of fun. We had a good time with that, Kevin. <laughs> I just told his name. But anyhow, uh, as we've been doing that and, and praying. And, and it's been a great opportunity and a reminder. We've handed out these wristbands. When you leave today, feel free to get one. It says, pray first, uh, our gift to you. It's a reminder to pray first, and no matter what happens. And as the thing was running out of gas, I saw my, my uh, wristband shaking. Okay, we're going to pray. And you know what? It's just so much better to give it to God and realize that we're going through life with God. It's so much better to have God along for the journey instead of just quarantining him to Sunday morning. Uh, and so I want to encourage you with that. We also have these booklets, which we'll be talking about as well. They're called Prayer First Booklets. I'm going to allude to this later on today. This is just something to help you and I to pray more effectively. There's some prayer models in here that are found throughout the Bible. And I know it would be an encouragement to you. This is our gift to you. Please take one in your, and as you exit here today. And uh, it's a gift for you to help you and I to be more effective in our prayers. All right. Well, today we're coming... Um, in the 21 days of prayer, and we have, we're ending this Saturday. And I just wanted to say that I, I have found that they've done surveys, and they have found that most people pray even more than the other activities that they normally would do. It's amazing. In fact, even atheists pray. If you've ever been on a plane, you hit an air pocket, I mean, everyone starts praying to something. I don't know about you, but it drives me a little crazy when I watch a movie sometimes, and uh, these tragic events happen in the movie or television program, and the people don't pray. My experience, and probably yours as well, is when difficult things happen, when you think your life is on the edge, and you're not quite sure you're going to make it, even people scream out, that, oh, Jesus, help me, right? I mean, people cry out to God. Why? Because there's something inside mankind that's been designed by God for God, and it's broken, and there is a longing to connect with God. There just is. And, and I've been talking to you weekly about this, and that, that we're designed by God, and even medical science tells us that, and even they're doing brain scans. I remember I mentioned almost every single week just to remember and to remind us that we are indeed are made for God. In fact, I was even reading that uh, a number of medical studies, some say yes, some say no, but uh, a good medical studies that were done in an unbiased way found two types of people that were being prayed for, and they got these intercessors praying for them, and some people were not prayed for, other people were prayed for, and they found that those who were prayed for healed faster than those that didn't. And of course, we know that prayer in Jesus' name brings great power. We're not just praying, praying, you can pray to Buddha, you can pray to another God, but prayers in faith to Jesus Christ, asking for God to move is power. How many of you here today would you say that because of prayer, you've been healed from one time or another? Just go ahead, look around, let's look around. Look at that. A lot of people here this morning uh, and have been healed because of prayer. Something extraordinary happened because of prayer. And this is what I found out from LifeWay Research. They're a publishing company in America today, and this is, they did a survey, and they found out the following. They found out 82% of uh, family and friends pray, and for family and friends, 82%. 74% of them pray for different problems and difficulties. People pray 37% for their enemies. I'm not quite sure what they pray for that. And about 12% of the time, people pray for government. Um, but uh, a lot of people, 36%, incidentally, said they prayed for financial prosperity, and 21% pray to win the lottery. <laughs> you see, only this morning I picked up, no, I, didn't, I don't do that, I'm just kidding. I'm, and, and this is a funny one, and I've done this, 13% pray for their favorite sports team to win. I guess if you have money on it, it might be a more of a thing. Okay, we're, we don't advocate gambling in any shape of the imagination, but people pray for all sorts of things, don't they? And 
Why don't people pray more? I think most of us here that call ourselves believers in Jesus Christ, we believe that prayer is important. If I ask any Christian that, that confesses Christ as their Savior, how important is prayer? Oh, it's very important. Prayer, prayer is key. Everything's key. But the question is that what we say and what we practice are often two different things. How many would you say that prayer is an easy thing? You guys are honest this morning. One person, praise God, you are a saint and... Uh, but, you know, prayer, people talk about praying, but people often don't pray. They don't make a habit of it. Why? Why is that? I think there's several different reasons. I think a lot of people don't know how to pray. They, they have these models that have been presented to them throughout their lives that just confuse them and intimidate them. It just, I believe that. They don't know how to pray. Uh, for example, Oh, Heavenly Father, Almighty God of the Celestial, we come to you in the mighty name of, you know, and they go on and on, and they, they have a little bravado in their voice, a little reverb, a little bit of uh, all kinds of things in their voice, and it sounds really impressive, or you're sitting there, and you have a Christian friend that you invite for lunch, and they pray, and it's like, it's amazing. You're like, wow, this should be put in a publishing book. They say, you want to pray? No, I'm all right. A lot of people really get anxious about public speaking, and they see prayer as like public speaking. And they get so intimidated, they're afraid even to pray to God, because they don't even think they can do a good job. And so, uh, like a lot of, I'm the same way in, in a lot of regards. If I can't do something well, I try to avoid it, because I don't like to fail. I rather really do something I'm good at. And so many people, I would say in the church today, don't pray a whole lot. When you call a prayer meeting, it's probably the least attended meeting in the church. Though it's the most important meeting in the church, we tend to make it the least attended meeting because we're intimidated by it partially. That's one reason. Another reason why we find it boring. I mean boring with a capital B. And I've been to those, I've been to times myself, I'm praying, oh Lord, I just, and Lord, I just pray for Uncle Jack and Oh, Lord, I pray for Uncle Jack. I repeat myself. You know, I've done that before. I prayed for meals when I'm praying for my kids to go to sleep. I mean, I, it, it's terrible. And some of us, we find it extremely boring. And I would say to you today, I don't believe that's just because it's boring. I think it's a mindset we have that prayer is boring. And number two, I do believe the enemy understands that, that prayer is powerful because it connects us to God and connects us to earth. It's the conduit that God works through. You can see it throughout Scripture that God primarily works when people pray to him. He doesn't act until people often pray. And so the enemy would try to discourage us by making us feel intimidated or making it boring. Where it just every time you pray, you're out to sleep. And you're like, I don't need a sleeping pill. All I have to do is pray. And I'm out. Right? So that's part of the reason. And, and then also people think, well, you know what? I, it's kind of selfish to pray for myself. That request is too small. I'm not going to ask God for uh, me to get a pay raise or a parking spot. Well, believe me, if you're Christmas shopping and you have only four hours left, you better be praying for a parking spot. Thank God for Amazon, right? And a lot of people just think, you know what? It doesn't make a difference anyhow. God is going to do what God is going to do. I want to encourage you to go to cornerstonecheshire.com and hit on pray first. We discuss a lot of these things in greater depth throughout the weeks, and you can go there. I'm not going to repeat myself, but I'm going to reiterate some things. But let me just say what prayer, first of all, prayer is. You know what prayer is? Prayer is talking to God. It is communication. And, and communication, it's a dialogue between us and God. That's what prayer is. It's not... Uh, not a monologue. And unfortunately, many times we look at prayer like a monologue. You're going to get up there like a late night comedian without being funny and just go off on your monologue or like a newscaster just telling the news. There just seems to be a loss of this, um, I'm speaking and I'm listening. I think we're really good at talking, but not really good at listening. I would say it's generally this, the case. And, and because we're better at talking than listening, God decided to give us two ears and one mouth. And I'm probably guilty of this, right? We, we often want to express ourselves, but we don't listen. But true communication is listening, not just talking. 
And so prayer is communicating with God, and, and God really wants us to communicate what He desires. And everything Je Jesus did in His life before He began His ministry, He went and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights before He chose His disciples. He prayed all night. We see Jesus constantly going away to a secret place of praying. Before He went to the cross, He was praying, and He had asked His friends to come along. And Jesus, Jesus taught uh, constantly by prayer, and His disciples knew the power of His prayer. And they said, Jesus, teach us not to raise the dead. Don't teach us how to walk on water. Jesus, teach just to pray because they understood the power he had came from his relationship with God. So how do you and I pray? Well, first of all, I want to tell you, it's just communication with God. That's what it is. And God really likes heartfelt honesty. Think about it. What relationship do you have here on earth where you meet somebody and it's just platitudes or just whatever? How you doing? All oh, the weather today, it's really hot, isn't it? Yeah. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. I praise God. I'm doing great. I'm highly favored and blessed by the Lord. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Meanwhile, they're doing horrible. And, you know, we, we just, let's be honest here this morning. Let's be transparent here this morning that we often are not honest when we, with our relationships. And we're not even honest with God sometimes, are we? But the thing about Scripture, I love the book of Psalms because it shows uh, primarily David and Aswan, different peoples are going through extraordinary, difficult sets of circumstances, and they're talking to God, and they're being flat-out honest. Gut-wrenching honesty happens. For example, if you want to just put the Scripture up there, we can see that. Heartfelt honesty in Psalm 5, 1 through 3. One through three. Here's King David speaking. Listen to this. O oh Lord, hear me as I pray. Pay attention to my groaning. That's right. He's groaning. Do you know groaning can be a part of prayer? For parents, come on, parents, let's be honest here. Let's, let's not be honest, but let's be truthful here. Your kids, if they're, oh, I don't feel well. Oh, you hear a little Johnny, a little Susie. Oh, you know what's going on. They're not feeling good right? That's a part of communication. What is a groaning? And, and so here the, here the King David says, I pay attention to my groaning. It doesn't have to be an eloquent, published book that you might buy in Barnes and Noble. He says, listen to, oh Lord, hear me as I pray. Pay attention to my groaning. Listen to my cry for help. Sometimes, you know, it's God wants it. God, I don't know what to do. Help. I don't know what's going on. Help, God. We've been reading through the Bible in a year. For a lot of us in our church, we've been reading through the book of Job. And man, Job is just bellowing out what he feels and he's being honest. And we thank God for that because if he didn't have that dialogue with God, we wouldn't know what it meant to suffer in many ways and how to handle suffering. And what does he say? I bring my request to you. Listen to my cry for help, my, my king, my God, for I pray to you, no one but you. Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I will bring my request to you, and I what? Wait. This is the part we struggle with. Wait expectantly. Now, to wait expectantly means there's an element of faith. I'm crying out, and I'm expecting God to speak back to me. I don't think a lot of times... We do that, do we? I, I really don't think we do that a lot of times. And if you look at Exodus 5, another uh, scripture that shows prayer and a difficult set of circumstances, here's Moses getting really frustrated with the Israelites. And look what he says here. Exodus 22, 23. It almost sounds like a husband and wife arguing about the kids, if you listen to this. Then Moses went back to the Lord and protested, why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord, why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he has, he has been even more brutal to your people, and I have done nothing to rescue them. He's being honest. God, I am frustrated with my job. God, I'm frustrated with my marriage. God, I'm frustrated with my parents. God, I'm frustrated with the whole thing, the whole system. Why do I have to have this illness? Why do I have to have this propensity? Why do I have to struggle with this issue? It's not fair. How come I just lost my job and my friend just got a pay raise and a signing bonus? It's not fair, God. Why me? Why am I always getting the short end of the stick, God? And sometimes I found this. When people don't have the courage to tell God how they feel, out of their frustration, they start attacking people. Because they don't, want to, they don't want to say anything bad to God. So they start going and finding their vent. You know, God's okay with you venting how you feel. He does not like complaining. 
but to tell them how you feel. It got, listen, what relationship you have that's of any value, earthly relationship, do you have any relationships where you just can't let your hair down? Well, I don't know how much to let down, but uh, you let your hair down and just tell like it is. Do you have any friends like that? And you can stop all the platitudes and say, you know what, I'm having a hard time. I'm feel Listen, the people that you share your deepest hurt with become your closest friends, don't they? Well, God wants to hear your cry. It's okay if you're having a bad hair day. It's okay if you're having a bad day. God likes to hear your voice. God wants to hear your voice. In Matthew 5, uh, 6, 5, it says this. When you pray, Jesus is talking about prayer here. He's saying when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues while everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That's all the reward they will get. Verse 7. But when you pray, don't babble on as people of the other religions do. Ten contentions and keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. And you say the same thing and over again. What relationship do you have? Anyone come up to you and say, Oh dad, oh dad, oh dad, oh dad, oh dad, oh dad, I love you, 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 dad, I love you. I mean, what kind of, what kind of, you'd say, let's call the psychiatrist, let's bring him to the hospital. He's lost his mind. What person talks that way to somebody? I don't know anybody that talks that way. But why do we do that to God? I think it's kind of insulting, personally. I'm not saying you're sinning, but I'm just saying, what kind of relate? I'm sure God's thinking, man, what if you just speak to me normal? What if you speak to me weird? Can you imagine? I go to my wife. Oh, thou dearest Sandra. <laughs> the sun glares in your hair. Your eyes gleam. I mean, come on. I'm not going to talk to her that way. I probably should. Maybe get more... Uh, <laughs> Put the shovel away. I'm not going to dig myself in a deeper hole. Okay, okay, okay. Um, but don't babble, it says in verse uh, Don't babble on people of religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words and again and again and again. And by the way, nagging doesn't work either, does it? Put that away, put that away, put that away, put that away. It's best to talk to your kids. Say, listen, you need to put that away. Or I'm going to put you away. Now that works. <laughs> that works. But don't go well, let, me, let me give you an illustration today. I'm going to pick on someone this morning, and, and I know we're running out of time because we did a few of the things in the service, but I, I, I'm going to pick on someone this morning. Who can I pick on? I'm going to pick on Kevin. Kevin, ma'am, may, mayhem. I'm going to say your name right one of these days. I've only known you about seven years. Uh, come up. Yeah, you're, you're on the spot. I hope you wore your Sunday's best. Oh, you didn't. Go ahead. I hope you at least shaved. I did. Okay. Well, Kevin, I, want to, I just want to let you know something, Kevin. I want to let you know how important you are to me. I find you an incredible friend. I want to tell you that you are such a great guy that I can trust you and that I know that when you do something, you do a great job. You're just a great guy. You're a man's man. You have a great family. And I just want to say you're awesome. And I think, I think what you say is so important. When you speak to me, the words of wisdom you bring me enlighten my life. It makes me a better person. And I just think you've got great, great insight about many, many things. And so, Kevin, I just want to let you know today, what do you think I should do about the whole situation with the stock market? going on? Should I sell? Should I buy? Should I put things in safe investments? Oh, I only have $25. What do you think I should do? And by the way, what do you think I should do with my car? My car's getting, you know, getting worked on. I know you like cars a lot, and I think things are going well. And do you think I should maybe like uh, fix the car up or sell the car? I, I, you know, I'm wondering. And, and also, I want to ask you uh, what you think about the Minnesota Vikings. But well, that's beside the point. Let me ask you another question. How, how's you and your wife doing? I, I, you know, just doing really good. Sure, okay. And things are really going well. And I just want to let you know how important what you say to me is so important, Kevin. I, we, the things you tell me, I just love when you, you just have such great advice. And when I spend time with you, I feel so much better of a person. Hey, good talking to you, Kevin. God bless you. I feel better. Okay. <laughs> okay you thought I was going to have to talk. No, no. Get down. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. That's an example. Yeah. I think Kevin and I are going to start a TV show. Uh, you got to see what we did together the other day. But that's an example of what we often do to God. We just sit there and we fire stuff at him and blow, 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 blow. You know, you drop stuff on God and then we head off. We don't listen. We give him a laundry list. We, we say what we need. God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I need this. God, I need that. God, help me with this. And we just say, okay, I'm done now, God. See you later. Boom. And God's like, huh? he's trying to talk back like Kevin was trying to talk back. Of course, he made him feel a little better. But nevertheless, but do we not do that with God? 
Prayer is two-way communication. Well, come on, I don't hear God. I don't hear God. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Jesus made a promise. He says, my sheep hear my voice. How do you hear his voice? I would say primarily you'll hear his voice through Scripture. This is why we encourage everyone in our church to make an opportunity every day, if you can, make it your priority to get into the Bible every day. Get a, get a reading plan. And I don't have time for today to tell you what it is, but we're reading through the Bible. We, we hit the Old Testament. We hit the New Testament. We hit the Psalm. We hit the Proverbs. I've been doing it for over 10 years. I have read the Bible probably 20, 30 times, cover to cover. And every time I go through, I find something in the most remote places, even through a list of genealogies, God has spoken to me through that. And what happens is this. When I read the Word of God, if, I'm a, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit begins to sit alongside of you and the Scriptures come alive. All of a sudden, I start hearing God speak through the scriptures. You know what I'm talking about. That still, small voice comes up. Wow, yes, I love you. You're important to me. And what happens is it tunes your ears. It's like taking a radio and turning that little dial in the old-fashioned, or the crystals, and, and not, not the crystals from New Age, but I'm talking about the radio crystals, and you begin to get the station. And when you pray like that with God in the morning, you spend a specific time with him. What it does is it helps you to, to be able to tell the difference between your voice, the world's voice, the enemy's voice, and God's voice. And it happens through scripture. So that's a great way to tune you in. And the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And then you can discern if it's of God, if it's not, because it doesn't co correlate with the Bible and the principles the Bible gives us not of God. So that's all part of it. Jesus says this, I only do what I give the laundry list to my father about. He doesn't say that. He said, only I do what the father shows me. That's what he says. And he says, in his biggest, darkest time of prayer, you want to see Jesus at his wit's end. Father, he's crying out to him. He's under great emotional distress. He says, Father, if you're able to release this cup from me from going to the cross, please, I'm all ears. And then he says something, not my will, but your will be done. He pours out his heart to God himself. And after that, what happens? He gets encouraged and built up. So even Jesus, he had a conversation. I don't only do what I see the Father doing. Are you telling me that God can speak to us throughout the day? Yes. Yes, he can. And yes, he will. He may not go, I want you to go here. Make a left here. He's not a GPS or make a left here. I mean, I'm sorry, you have to have a female voice for the GPS. I don't know why they do that. It's a little bit sexist if you ask me, but that's beside the point. Uh, but that's what begins to happen. My sheep hear my voice. And one of the ways you hear his voice is by listening to his word. And then you'll start hearing God throughout the day speak in your inward being like when you're reading the scripture. And you can begin to hear from God. I can't tell how many times the Lord said, text this person, call this person, do this, do the other, and I call them and do it, and it's like, how did you know? Because the Lord put, me on, put, put you on my heart. It's a direct line to God. Speaking of phone calls, I, I heard a, uh, something a little while ago that a journalist was talking to Rick Warren, and uh, did a, you know, Rick Warren, a purpose-driven life, great, one of the great, great, great pastor, tremendous man. And he was sitting there, and he was doing an interview with one of the reporters, and, and it was in his office. He says, what's that red phone there? He says, oh, that's a direct line to God. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. How much does that cost you? Oh, it's about $25,000 a minute. But, you know, it's well worth it, because there's been times in my life where I really need to know what I'm supposed to do, and I'd pick up that phone, and, and $25,000, that's a lot of money, but you make the right decision. You go, wow. Well, the same guy later on, interviewer goes to Billy Graham. And oddly enough, he sees another red phone. It looks like a bat phone. Remember the bat phone? Okay. So he sees a red phone. It's red. He's like, well, what's that for? And Billy Graham goes, well, that's my direct line to God. Really? How much does it cost you? Oh, it's about $5,000. Well, Rick Warmer is 25. Well, that's because I have a closer relationship. So he goes and he says, man, what's going on with this huge church in Texas? This is, you know, this uh, Lakewood church. And he talks to Joe Holstein. And Joe, hi, how you doing? You know, he's smiling and, you know, and just having a good old time. And good to see you. And God bless you. And we're so glad you're here today. And he's just talking and having a good time. And he says, hey, 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 I, I noticed there's a, red, there's a red phone on your desk. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What is it? Well, it's my direct line to God. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, how much does it charge? Oh, it's only 25 cents a minute. 
Why is that? Because it's a local call. <laughs> All that for that. It wasn't worth it. I just wasted two minutes and I'm running out of time. All right. I love what A.J. Gordon says, a really great quote that would blow your, kind of make you go, huh? Almost like a Yogi Bear-ism. But this is what he says. He says, you can, do, you can do no more than, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can never do more than pray until you've prayed. Now put that on your pipe and don't. Put it in the, no. Put that in your refrigerator and eat it. We don't do that. You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can never do more than pray until you've prayed. And what is that talking about? We're talking about reliance upon God, knowing you don't do this thing by yourself. Philippians 4, 6 says the following, be anxious for everything. No, I'm sorry. That's the humanism version. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. That means everything. God, help me find my wallet which has been an ongoing prayer of mine. <laughs> and incidentally, I've done that and I've found stuff. Okay. Uh, but in everything by prayer, in supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be known, be known to God. It says in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God loves you, wants to hear what's on your heart. He loves to know what his children, that's why we call him Abba Father, God the Father. God really likes the fact when you core out your heart to him, tell him how you feel. Even, I've just been times I'd say, God, I'm really angry with this person, I wanna punch him out. God, I wanna just ugh, go to town. I had to be honest with him. And then I get off my chest, and then I feel better. And then I go just punch, some, punch the wall. So that, it works great. But, but this is all, you can do that way. And Jesus says this in John 14, 13, you can ask anything in my name and I'll do it for you, that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. It doesn't mean it's an abracadabra. Oh, Jesus, I pray, pay my mortgage right now. No, pray in my name means in his purposes, in his, in his mission. That's what it's all about. And I don't have time today to look into it right now, but I will say this. The book of James says, you have not because you ask not. But when you ask, you ask with wrong motives. And that's what's so wonderful about asking God. He'll help us to look at our motives. And of course, it also says, pray continually. And this is the thing that we really have to work on, myself included, is to stay in a prayerful state throughout the day. I've called it for many years now in this church. You've been around here for a period, I call it walkie-talkie mode, where I never hang up the phone, but I have the walkie-talkie on. I'm expecting God to speak. I'm walking through today. I like what Smith Wiggleworth says. He says, um, great, great English um, healing evangelist of the last century. He said the following, I, I never pray more than 25 minutes, but I never go without praying more, uh, less than 20 minutes at a time. In other words, I don't pray more than 25 minutes, but I don't go without praying more than 20 minutes. So he always kept praying going on. He kept a prayerful state. What would happen if you and I would learn, imagine what our marriages would look like if we learned to pray throughout. Well, imagine how your, your sales calls would be. Imagine how you'd be with your children. Imagine how you'd be with your teachers. Imagine how you would be with all the things that you and I struggle with. We don't have to sit there and worry, get all anxious. Hey God, you see what just happened right now? I just ran out of gas. That's a story for another time. And, and I like what it says about that. And, and it, says, uh, it says, pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. But this is God's will. We don't give thanks for stuff that happens. We give thanks that God is with us. And I like what I heard from, I don't know who I heard it from a number of years ago. I heard about being push prayer. And, and being a New Englander and coming from a long island, we like to be pushy. And I like this, push acronym. Pray until something happens. Until God says, nope, I'm not gonna do it, like he told to Paul. Pray until something happens. Don't give up on prayer. I knew a woman, uh, a woman named Joanne in my previous church. She prayed for 18 years for her husband to come to faith. 18 years. He finally came to faith and he became a doctorate in theology, and he's a wonderful man of God today, and he's grown to be a tremendous person that works in healing and all that. And she she worked and she, yes, right. She labored for 18 years to pray. I'm gonna ask the worship team to make their way up. Pray until something happens. I love what it says here. James 5, 16 and 17. Confess 
your sins to God alone. Doesn't say that, does it? No. Confess your sins to what? Each other. Now, don't tell everyone your problem, but people that you can trust. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. I don't know if you recognize this fact, but God has not created us to be me and God alone. He's created us to be connected to Christ, which is the head, and he created us to be connected to his body, which is the church. Why do we encourage you to go to small groups? Not so we can say, we got small groups. No, we want to help create environments and situations and a catalyst to help you foster relationships so when something happens, you can pray for somebody, you can have dialogue with somebody, you don't have to go through life alone. Will you pray with me about this situation? I'm really struggling with this situation. And you know you got men and women praying for you that care about you. My friends, that is so valuable that I can pick up my phone and I can call my pastor friends and listen, I'm going through it. Would you please pray for me? And they'll pray for me. And I can just let down my little hair left and I can say, would you please pray for me? And they can do that. It's powerful to have friends, and that's why I want to encourage you when you leave here today to grab one of these cards and, and to say, you know what, I'm going to invest. And it, Maybe it's not the right group initially, but you know what? You don't get friends by complaining that you don't have any. You get friends by getting involved in people's lives. And you become friends by caring about somebody else. Listen, God wants to see this church connected. Yeah, it's not all about you and God or just coming to Sunday. And which the Bible says they met together daily. So I want to encourage you to do that. I just want to ask also the ushers to get ready for communion. Let me ask you a question today. How are you with God? Do you even talk to God at all? I don't feel I'm good enough for God. Well, guess what? None of us are good enough for God. But I tell you what makes us good enough for God, Jesus Christ. Jesus took our place on the cross. He says, Father, he says, uh, forgive them for they know not what they do, right? The Bible says if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, you will be saved. It's giving your life to Jesus Christ and saying, Lord, I give you everything. You're number one in my life. I turn my life over to you. No longer do I live for myself. God, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I declare that you are my God and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. It's that simple. You do that with a sincere heart. And you may not have it all together yet. You may have a lot of garbage and baggage in your life. God loves you so much. He takes you as you are, but he loves you too much to keep you that way. And so let's right now take a moment. I don't know where you are today, but let's just bow our heads for a moment. If you still need, if you need to get the elements, it's fine. Let's just pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I, I've tried too long to do this by myself. I've been playing with you. I've been flirting with you. I've been saying, yeah, I believe in you. But Lord, I, to be honest, I've never given my heart fully to you. I've never gone head first into a relationship with you. It's always been God, but today I lay aside my condition clauses in the contract with you, and I realize it's not a contract, it's a relationship. God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins in Jesus' name. I receive forgiveness of my sins in Jesus' name. I confess my sins to you right now. Maybe you need to tell the Lord some things right now that he's bringing to your attention. I confess my known sins and unknown sins, and I ask right now that you forgive me of them all. Thank you. You said that if I confess my sins with my mouth, you will forgive me as far as the east is from the west. I give my life to you today. Have your way in me today, and give me the strength to walk the, the path you have for me in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Maybe every head bowed. Just, just quickly, so I know how to maybe just to pray more effectively for you. If you say, Pastor, that was me today. I, I just made a new commitment to God I have never really made before. I've, I've fallen away and I've come back. Can I just see a quick show of hands? Anyone here today say, Pastor, that would be me. Okay, anyone else, thank you for being honest today. And I encourage you, um, to find, we can find a pathway to help you get closer to God. Anyone else here this morning say, Pastor, that's me. Listen, it, it's, it's great when you just acknowledge that because what it does, it, it just connects you. Because the Bible says, you confess before men, I'll confess before the Father. Anyone here today say, Pastor, that's me. Okay, let's just pray. I also want to pray for those right now that are saying, you know, my prayer life stinks. And, or my prayer life could be better. I know my prayer life could be better. Let's just pray right now and ask God to touch our prayer life. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would just ignite a fire of prayer in this place. Father, we don't want to wait. From a report from a doctor that's dire, we don't want to wait for a national or world calamity to pray to you. 
We want to pray to you in days of peace. We want to prepare ourselves now, Lord. We want to have a relationship with you now. Father, we thank you that you love us. And Lord, I just pray that you'd put prayer in our hearts, that we can be honest and we can be open to you. We don't have to put on platitudes, Father, that we can be honest and truthful with you, that we can just pour out our hearts to you, Father. And I just pray, Lord God, that you'd begin to answer prayer like never before, God, as we take the remainder of this week to, to take 21 days as we finish off this week in prayer. Lord, I just pray that we would just ignite and we want to dedicate this new coming fall season to you, asking that you'd bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jesus said, this is my body which has been broken for you. Thank you, sweetheart. You know, a lot of us have broken situations, broken bodies, broken health, broken relationships, broken finances, whatever it can be. Christ was broken that we could be whole. And so I want to encourage you today, right now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can do this. If, if you're not a believer in Christ, I ask you not to do it. Or if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you have unforgiveness in your heart and you won't let it go, don't take it because you're mocking what Christ did on the cross. Christ forgave us a lot more than anyone has done against us. And so if you say, I'm not going to forgive that person, you're basically hitting Jesus in the head. You're basically plucking his beard and, and slapping his face. Because everything that Jesus does is forgiveness. That's the basic, that's the founding principle in many ways of Christianity is that Christ forgives us who do not deserve forgiveness. If you're not willing to forgive somebody, and if you, if you feel something coming up in you right now, listen, that's okay. If you feel that something, oh, I can't, that person, that hurt me. Okay, that's okay to, do, to say it hurts you. But you have to say, Father, I forgive this person despite how I feel. I am obedient to you. If you're not willing to do that, don't take communion, please. This is serious, folks. We believe the real presence of God is here right now. Jesus says, take, eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. All of you take, eat. After they supped, Jesus took the wine. And he said, this is the new covenant. This is the new way of doing things. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you gather together. What can cleanse us? What can wash us? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So, Father, we thank you that because of your blood, it's payment for everything we've ever done wrong and will ever do wrong. All we have to do is access the account of your blood. It's enough to pay for all of our sins, even stuff we've done on purpose, if we confess and we turn away from it in Jesus' name. Take drink, all of you. Let's all stand if we could. Appreciate your patience this morning. We went a little longer than normal, but let's go ahead and stand and, and let's sing the closing song as we do that. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. If you need prayer for anything at all, or maybe you prayed that prayer today, we have some stuff for you to help you out. When you leave today, feel free to grab one of these blue books and get involved. Get connected, folks. Let's not be isolated. Let's not be silos. Let's be a community of believers that works together. Amen? God bless you. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus, Jesus conquered the grave. So Savior, Savior, He can move the mountains. God bless you guys today. Go out in the rest of the Lord. If you need prayer for anything at all, if you want someone to join in with you and say, will you pray for me about this? This is an opportunity to do such. Otherwise, we dismiss you. Sign those green cards. Have some coffee and enjoy the holiday. God bless you.